Hey everybody, welcome to Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matt. And I am the substitute teacher today. I am hip dead. Yes, that is not Tyler. Aged up. That's actually another person. Uh, Tyler is not with us today. We're flying without Tyler. I'm not exactly sure where Tyler is. He's kind of ghosting me a little bit. I'm assuming that he's sleeping, given the fact that he was messing around with Windows early this morning. So, he probably, Windows probably killed him. Let, let's just be honest with it. Windows has probably murdered Tyler. I'm, I'm guessing that's probably the way it is. Uh, but anyways, welcome to Linux Cast. This is where we talk about Linuxy things, uh, as we usually do. Now, I know we have been off for a couple weeks. We've been having a hard time getting uh, two people actually in the same room. Uh, one week was my fault. Last week was Tyler's, and I just wanted to be lazy. So... No, nothing the last two weeks, but we're back on the road again. We're going to talk about some Linuxy stuff today, but as we usually do, we're going to talk about what we've done recently in open source. So, Hip Dad, take us away. Have you done anything re uh, interesting recently? Sort of on topic, I did find a uh, program called uh, tube to go and it's two, T-U-B-E, the numeral 2, G-O. And you can actually download YouTube videos. I mean, it's, it's it's just an easy process. You just find the video you want, and then you can download it to your computer, and you've got it. I downloaded uh, your last uh, broadcast. Cool. So that but that's 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 pretty much it as for me as far as I mean. I'm running Arco Linux, and I'm in the two year challenge, and I'm in my second year. I've already done a year uh, since you give me credit for the six months. But I went and did a reinstall, and everything's pretty much stable. Reduced my packages by almost double. I'm able to work. My main concern when I install Linux is that I have to be able to use RIM in a remote desktop through a VPN to access my work so I can just easily do that. And with Linux, it's been pretty easy. The uh, VPN uh, that I use was available in the Arco repositories, which was amazing. So I set up my laptop with the software I needed, and then I went and did a clean install of Arco Linux because I had KDE 6, Plasma 6, just really munged up my system. So I switched to XFCE, and I haven't looked back. I, li I like XFCE. It is a great desktop environment. I've been using GNOME. It's not a great desktop environment, but it's... Okay. It's not the best. It's not great. <laughs> I, I have it's mixed... Just, Go ahead. It's too slow for me. It's I don't drags. Yeah, I don't have any problems with it being slow. I have problems with the ability to customize stuff that you can't. Um, but I've just loaded it down with like 20 extensions and it's still not as customizable as I want it to be, but it's better than without extensions, so that's good. And I know that I'm kind of living on the edge here with using extensions because eventually one of those is going to break or GNOME will break one of the extensions or something. But I do what I have to in order to actually, you know, use this thing. I do did finally get XFC working again on my computer, so I should be able to use that when GNOME eventually, you know, shits the bed. Hopefully that won't be uh, too far, you know, hopefully that won't happen for a very long time, but we'll see. I've just been looking for something that's stable, and so far, GNOME has been fine. Uh, even the Wayland version, which has been good, so, yeah. So you still, you're still really liking Arco? Yeah, I love Arco. Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed at Arco, mainly. Main reason I like it is I can repair it. I can fix it. The old days, I would just wipe out a system and install clean. Yeah, did you try one of their new UR, uh, ISOs now that he's went through and cleaned things up? I tried the um, Zen version, but it wouldn't install properly for me, so I went back to what I knew, and I installed the Arco Linux B, and it was flawless. Yeah, he cleaned up the, the ISOs, but he didn't clean up the website. The website's still a... Uh bloody mess which is well i mean he makes up for it in all the uh youtube videos he makes for instructions that's true so you you, you had something that you were going to ask me i, I forgot i kind of talked over you there what did you do in your linux week 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sharp is my turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I've still been messing around with my home lab. We'll talk about more of this in the main topic, I'm sure. But the uh, I, I've just been getting everything set up in my home lab to the point where I'm trying to host all the Docker images that I find. Uh, I'm like a little kid. Oh, there's a Docker image. It looks really cool. Let's host that one. Let's do this one, that one, that one, this one. Uh, at this point, I probably have about 10, 15 Docker images that I'm hosting in Portainer. And it's been fun. Like it's been really, really fun. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot about using Portainer and Docker images and messing around with Nginx and stuff like that. It's been, it's been highly educational. Uh, also frustrating at times because, you know, I'm a noob, but uh, I've had a lot of fun with it. So the project for this morning was to get audio bookshelf up and running and that, that worked out well. And I found a, uh, an app that I'll talk about later that will allow me to use it on my phone, which is nice. So uh, that's basically what I've been doing is trying to figure out ways to self-host everything, which is going to lead well into the main topic. But other than that, I haven't done much other than just work, work, work. And then I have been messing around with GNOME as much as possible to try to get to be the exact way that I want it to be. I, I'm mostly there now, I think, in terms of you know, look and feel and functionality, but I don't know. I still have my qualms with it. I think I always probably will, to be honest with you. I probably you stepped like. into the Josh zone. Yeah, he's a he's a GNOME guy, isn't he? He he, he messaged me when I told when I made that video talking about moving to GNOME and, and wanting it to be stable. He tried to get me to use vanilla GNOME without any extensions. Like I just can't do it. I I can't. I like physically can't bring myself to use vanilla GNOME. There's just no way. There's certain things that I have to have. Like, he wants me to not use tweaks too, right? I think that's what, what he said was not to use tweaks Oh, GNOME either. tweaks? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the, at the bare minimum, I want to be able to minimize my windows. Like, I just want to be able to minimize my windows. And you can't do that. <laughs> like, you can't do that on vanilla GNOME. They don't want you to minimize your windows. Like, it's the stupidest stupidest thing i've ever seen like, like why is that not a feature that you can do like out of the box like every other well i don't even know maybe you can't do that in in mac os anymore like i thought every win every operating system you could do that but maybe gnome's just trying to be different i don't know it was it's infuriating so you have to use gnome tweaks to do that and you have to you if and if you use like dash to panel you can then use it so that if you click on the one of the icons in the panel it will then minimize the thing you know the window and that's, that's the what way that, XFCE does. That's the way that it should work. Like XFC does it, KDE does it, you know, Budgie does it, you know, you name it. That's the way that it works. Uh, but not on GNOME for whatever reason. It's, it's the stupidest thing ever. I don't understand. So I can, I, there's at, just that one thing would require me to at least install tweaks and, and one extension and then. There are other things that really bug me, like I want to be able to customize the bar at the top, right? I want to add some stuff to it. I, I want the like the the task bar icons, the task the the system tray icons, like that with like if Discord has an icon up there, the in the Dropbox and OBS, all of those icons, you can't get those without an extension. I want to have certain things just to work a certain way. And in order to do that, you have to have an extension. So there was no way, absolutely no way I could use vanilla. And I just couldn't do it. I would I would have long since just uninstalled the GNOME pattern in OpenSUSE and installed Plasma, which is what I would have done. Uh, may I'm still doing that. I don't know. I have XFC installed as well, so I may uh, use that for a little while. But as anti Wayland as I used to be right now with the way my monitors are set up because they're different resolutions and refresh rates. I kind of have to have Wayland in order to have that stuff working. So I'm XFC doesn't have Wayland. So I'm, I'm resisting switching to XFC, even though I, I prefer that as a desktop environment. So I don't know. Yeah, it, it probably ended up be plasma eventually just going back to there, but I, I really want stability and plasma has never been very stable for me. Like at all, I want it to be. I wanted it to be. I wanted Plasma Six to be, to be so awesome, and it wasn't. It was just, yeah. It was just. It, it reminded me of uh, Plasma Four when it first came out. So, when it first came out, and I installed it from the 
secondary repos in OpenSUSE. It was actually very stable. I used it for a whole, you know, like a couple weeks, and then I did my review of it. And then the the updates started coming out. <laughs> like as soon as they started issuing a whole bunch of updates, like it went to six point zero point one or whatever, that's when it started getting buggy. And it continued to degrade to the point where when I came back to my computer, after my computer was to sleep, I would wake my computer up. And this monitor would be working perfectly fine. This monitor would come on, but it'd be a completely black screen. All you could see is the mouse and there'd be no panels. And as far as I know, there's no way to actually restart the Wayland session. You have to just log out and log back in or do a hard reboot. Because I had no panels on this monitor, these two monitors over here, so I had no way of really rebooting it, otherwise going into the TTY and just rebooting it. So I don't know if it's something with my hardware or if it's because I have two wonky monitors, but I was having those problems. And you see people all the time, it's like, oh, I'm having a good time with Plasma 6, it's working fine for me. Plasma is really like the desktop environment that works differently for everyone. Because it re is really very much, it feels like it's either hardware dependent or maybe it's just because of versioning in different distros or something like that. But you have this situation where you can be using like Plasma 6 on KD Neon or Fedora or whatever, and it works perfectly fine. But on OpenSUSE or, or in a certain particular arrangement of hardware, it's really buggy or whatever. And that's why when people say, well, like, oh, it's working fine for me. You know, well, that's you. You must have the situation where it works fine for you. It didn't work fine for me, and and this particular hardware and this particular uh, setup of packages and stuff. So maybe I'll give it another try. If the GNOME thing doesn't work out, we'll see. Yeah, I, I had the choice to go ahead and uh, use KDE when I did my reinstall, but uh, I was so pleased with XFCE and its ease of use that. I just, and plus Thunar is my default uh, file manager and I can put all the tweaks in it. And so I was, I was happy with staying with XFCE. Yeah. Also the guy who said Linux is like dog do. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> bye. bye. <laughs> yeah. Troll be uh, gone. I, I've seen you make many comments. I was very lenient for the first few, few of them and then uh, goodbye. Anyways, why would you, if you don't like Linux, why are you on trollies a Linux be channel? Trollies. Like, yeah. I don't understand. Trolls Whatever. be trolleys. Yeah. Anyway, so that's what we've been up to. Let's go ahead and move on to the main topic. So we are, we're, we're going to do a little bit of a niche pro topic this time. Uh, I, at least I feel like it's kind of niche because it's going to kind of play into the self-hosted stuff. But I also want to kind of talk about subscriptions and all this kind of weird stuff that's kind of going on right now. Because we, we, I don't know if you saw this, Hip Dad, but... A few weeks ago, whatever, so Sony basically said anybody who bought a certain TV show on their PlayStations pulled all of it, right? And we've seen this a couple times now where these companies who have, you know, you buy this digital content from somebody and then they lose the rights to, to basically ha for you to have that content and they basically yoink it, right? And this has happened multiple times just in the last few months it's been you know big news and people have been you know they freak out usually a lot of times like happened with the sony one they had you know there was a people went up in arms there was a whole bunch of media coverage and then sony backed off and said well you get to keep it for you know the next six months or whatever and then it's still going to go away that's obviously not always going to work so i want what i wanted to talk about was the things that we feel are something that you can actually own yourself and the kind of the tools that go along with that. Yeah. So do you subscribe to like a mu music streaming stuff, Hip Dad? I uh, used to with uh, Google Play, but then when they went to YouTube, I because you couldn't download them when they switched to YouTube. You couldn't download your MP3 to your device and keep it. You had to use YouTube only to listen to the music you bought. So I, I do buy my movies from YouTube, which I wished I could download them, but I can't, but I still do buy my YouTube video, my videos from YouTube. I just don't, uh, snag music as much as I used to. I mean, I've got like 30,000 songs, tracks and stuff from way back in the day when I could do the, uh, alternate downloads, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I got uh, sent a uh, snail mail a long time ago from downloading a movie, and they told me to cease and desist, so I haven't 
done any illegal stuff since then. So do you you do you have like um a preferred way that so you you don't really listen to music or you just use you have those thirty thousand you play them in rhythm box or something? Yeah, I play them in rhythm box. But when I do want music, if I find something I want, I usually jump through the hoops and find uh, a link on the uh, artist website where you can do a straight download so I can get the straight MP3. So I actually own it rather than going through a uh, music service where you have to use their player to play it. I just download it straight up and you can usually find it, but it takes some jumping around in their links. And if I can't, if I can't download a straight MP3, I don't buy it. I don't download it, but I don't buy it. So I have Spotify. I have YouTube Music because I subscribe to YouTube Premium. And at one point, I also had Apple Music, all three at the same time, uh, for various reasons. And it's the same thing with, like, I have Kindle Unlimited. I have, like, Philo for... <laughs> Zany's finally, finally online. <laughs> I have I have Philo for some for TV streaming. I have YouTube TV for the TV out in the living room, which is something that we really want to get rid of, but we're, we're kind of stuck with the TV that we have and the setup we have, unfortunately. And you know, I have a couple others, and I'm sure I'm probably forgetting about. It. So I have all these subscription services. I've just been thinking because every one of them is constantly raising prices. Like every year, they raise it, the price at least twice. And it's like, oh well, well you know, when Netflix was like seven dollars or something like that that's a was a hell of a buy and when you know even when it was like ten dollars you're like oh it's only ten bucks i can afford ten bucks and you know i used it enough t ten bucks is, is worth it and, and then when it was like 12 bucks like you know like you know all right 12 bucks is fine and that's what that's really kind of the way they get you right it's like oh they only it's only a couple more dollars and you know i, I can afford a couple more dollars but that couple dollars was another couple dollars, another couple dollars, now they're up to $20 a month, and that's just for Netflix, and then you have, you know, uh, YouTube TV, which, you have, like, like, my cable company that we use for cable way out here in the boondocks, it's the only play, only company that we can get unless we want to go to, like, satellite or whatever, right? And we want regular, straight-up cable. They don't do cable TV anymore. Like, they completely cut out all their cable TV offerings. All they offer is the internet. That's all they got. So if you want live TV, you have to have a streaming service of some, of some kind. And we chose YouTube for some reasons. But YouTube has gone from forty nine ninety nine to six to fifty nine ninety nine to sixty nine ninety nine. Now they're like seventy five dollars. And like, first off, half of the TV shows that they offer as part of the things are things that you can get over the air. And that bugs me. Like, I want to just go to over the air and then have, like, because Philo's is another one that we have that kind of supplements that because it has a few of the few channels that YouTube doesn't have. And that's only $25 a month. So being able to, if we could do just over the air, like with a home, HD home run or something, and then the Philo, that would kind of get us all the way there. But it's process. And my as i've gotten gotten into this home lab stuff and the self hosting stuff i've started to realize that there are some places that i can actually you know just not deal with the subscription stuff anymore like for music now i can go through and build my own local collection back up it's, it's been i mean i have a local collection but it's out of date because a lot of the new music and stuff i just don't have because i've been focusing on streaming for the last probably 10 years so i was you know i i've just you know i've got plex up and running i've been looking into ways to do ebooks and audiobooks and stuff like that and yeah some of that stuff is the r type stuff if you know what i mean but a lot of stuff I have been able to buy, like on, uh, I I do have a, or have had at times an Audible subscription. I've been able to download some of that stuff and put that in audiobook shelf, so that's been been okay. So it's been. I think that this topic is going to be something that is is more prevalent as we go along because the stuff is getting more and more expensive. More more and more people are looking like you know what? I can't afford to have five subscriptions because it's actually more expensive than cable used to be and i don't know that any other like isp has gone down the road that mine has where they just gotten rid of all their cable offerings but i, I assume some of them have and that means that you're kind of stuck with the more expensive 
streaming options and that really is not it, it's not sustainable for the vast majority of people you know what i mean well this all started in the beginning i live in a small town and I, when cable first came to the town they had to have permission to run the lines on the poles etc so they had a town meeting and when they had a town meeting they Basically, their sell, sell spot was, imagine TV with no advertising. That didn't last long. And now we have, I went with AT&T. AT&T, originally, when I moved out of town, because it's the only service I could get. So they said, okay, you can have unlimited data if you subscribe to DISH. So... I subscribed to Dish thinking, since I'm playing World of Warcraft, that I'm going to, you know, hit my data cap, which at that time was, uh, I think, 600 gigs. And I found out it was a two-year contract, though. So I found out uh, in the middle of that two years that I was, even at my longest days of playing World of Warcraft, I had maybe hit 125 gigs. So I didn't need that. So when the two year two years was up, I stopped it. And when I tried to stop it, the guy kept saying, you sure you want to do this? We can offer you this. I said, you need to shut up. I said, I can only watch Harry Potter so many times. And I don't want it. None of your stuff is appealing to me. So just stop talking. I ended up telling them to go to hell and hung up on them. But they stopped it. And I still, and then they raised their data cap now is to 1.5 terabytes and i never get close to that but netflix you know they went from six dollars a month which is cool and now for i think i'm paying 9.99 a month you get advertising you have to bump up to like 15 dollars i think to drop the advertising yeah they're all and doing, they're all doing that and somebody said uh buy the dvds now a lot of your DVDs, they don't even, some of your DVDs don't even come with a DVD. They come with an access code where you access it online. And that's the only way you can watch the DVD is through an online access. That's just insane. So you're talking about data caps. They have ours at 3,072 gigabytes. And we use about half of that each month is usually where we go. And that's streaming the TV but, you know, sometimes 12 hours a day and then all the stuff here I do online, you know, all the YouTube for the various computers in the house, all that stuff. So um, we have, we haven't even, I think one month we were over 2000 gigabytes that, I mean, and I, it seems like a lot. And I, when we, when we had to go through this, go to and switch to the YouTube TV, we, there was times where I would worry that we would hit that data cap, but we haven't ever come close, which is good because in order to get the, you know, quote unquote unlimited, we'd have to go up another tier in the internet thing. And that's another like 30 or 40 bucks a month, which we don't want to do, obviously. So uh, the, the data caps have always been a thing, but wow, which is the ISP we have didn't always have data caps at all. And when, when they decided that they were going to institute them, people freaked out and they had to, you know, roll them out really slowly. It ends up, being not that bad because they made them high enough which is fine but i don't know what the data caps on the lower tiers are actually are to be honest with you plus they want to uh, charge you extra money when you do reach that cap if you want to you know actually get more so now You can download the song and have it locally, but it has obviously DRM on it. So what I've done is just cancel Spotify. And I'm going to do all local music, run it through Plex. And while that does have a fee, if you want all the features, it's like 40 bucks a year or whatever, which is way better than the $10 a month for Spotify. So plus it allows me to have separate libraries. So if I want to have, you know, a library for me and then a library for the family, I can keep the music separate because you have different music tastes and I don't have to worry about them. Plus, if you wanted to, one of the coolest things I found about Plex actually recently is that if I wanted to grab one song for a playlist in my library from that other library, you can do cross library playlists, which is really cool. Um, so that, that's what I've been doing for music. I'm also going to do that for movies and TV shows. And even if I have to 
actually find physical copies of the mu movies and TV shows that I want and then rip them, that's what I'll do. I'm, I'm just n have n no interest whatsoever in paying for the subscriptions anymore if, unless I absolutely have to. There's going to be a few that I'm going to have absolutely have to. So like the YouTube TV, that's going to have to be a thing that I'm going to have to deal with until I figure out how to, to do more uh, over-the-air stuff. So like we have an over-the-air antenna, but... With the way things go in my house, it's it. You, we have to be able to change the channels either with a traditional in the traditional way with channel numbers, right? Which is not something YouTube TV does, or we have to be able to control it with the Google Assistant because of bad vision, bad vision in the house and stuff, right? So, um, being able to do that with over the air with our current setup is impossible. It just can't be done. So in order to get over the air and then go to a cheaper streaming option like Philo, we'd have to get a new TV. And at the moment, that's just you know not going to happen. So I, I miss the old days where you could go to YouTube and watch a video, a movie or whatever. You could watch it. And then you, all you had to do was go into your cache file and find the FLV file. And there's you could just move it. And then you had it. And you could watch it later locally. But you, that once they got rid of Flash, and that's the reason they got rid of it, because it was too easy to hack. But uh, they, uh, the reason why, I mean, what I've always wanted is for the cable companies, if I would buy cable, if, or Dish, or whatever, or any streaming service, I would buy it if I could pay to, if I could select the channels I wanted, which would probably be 10 channels, you know, at best. But the reason why they don't allow that is because the religious channels wouldn't make any money. So they're the ones lobbying to stop it. No, it's not. It, okay, so it's not the uh, the religious channels. It's all the smaller channels. That's how those are are are, are subsidizes with the ones that actually make the money. It's it's like um, it's like intramural sports in college, right? Like. Um, male men's lacrosse female lacrosse you know the, the small like even baseball in a lot of schools softball they don't make any money it's it's football and basketball that make money and and that pays for all the smaller sports both men and women right it's the same thing with 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 co with cable tv and stuff like it's the, that's what pays for the small ones but that that was the whole idea behind streaming it was like you can you, if you want just netflix you can just buy netflix if you want just if, if you want just you know the the discovery stuff you can go buy max whatever and, and that's still fine and it's still kind of doable if you're smart about it unfortunately they keep raising the prices and it makes it a lot harder but it, if you're smart about it and you let's say you want to watch you know Game of Thrones or whatever and that's on Max you go watch you subscribe to Max for a, a, a month you watch Game of Thrones and then you cancel and then you don't have to pay for it month 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 right and that's that's the way you kind of have to do it if you want to try to save money instead of having a whole bunch of you know things that just basically turn into a very large expensive cable bundle so it, it's just um, that we had we had this dream right and, and you talked about it being able to just choose a few channels that that's the that's the dream on cable it was never going to happen because of the way they had to subsidize the smaller channels and stuff whatever you know because you know without them um, you know things like you know the id channel or whatever would never make make a go of it but the but most most of your uh, your uh, local uh, cable channels are gone now. You know how you used to have a local channel for your community? They don't have those anymore, do they? There's like four of them here in our area. I don't know if that's the same everywhere else, but we have we have we have like four of different ones here just for our little Podunk High it has a couple of them. Uh, they let the students have one, and there's one for the administrators, and then there's one for the city of Portland, and then there's you know just a general one that's kind of like Lansing based or something. But the you know like the the idea behind the the streaming was oh it was was trying to lead us towards the dream, but we let them it evolved basically back into cable because you, if you want to have all of the stuff or you know some, most of the stuff they kind of merged themselves all together into these gigantic bundles which is just basically like what cable was you know or 
you know, 10 years ago. And, and it's more expensive than it was when it was just cable. <laughs> and it's actually worse. I don't know if you've noticed this, Dad, but you've no on TV, there's not as much good stuff on TV as there used to be. Maybe it's just because I'm getting older and, you know, I don't... Um, I'm attached to the things that I grew up with. Like, you, you know, you, with music, you get attached to the stuff you grew up with and you get, kind of have a, a generation of music that you're mostly attached to. And maybe TV shows are basically the same way for me, but it feels like there's less good stuff on TV than there used to be. And you pay more, you get less. Uh, Trafferton in the chat said, and shittification, that's basically what all this boils down to. Well, yeah, I mean... I watch over the air TV every now and then, um, but that's just when I'm severely bored. And you can only watch uh, Law and Order, all the different versions, so many times. That's what's on pretty much every channel. The reruns, right? They show show the mm -hmm. same six episodes over and over again. Like for example, my mom and dad watches the Game Show Network, and they had they apparently bought one year of the show match game with Gene Rayburn and they play it every <laughs> every day during the 1 to 2 o'clock hour. They only bought one year. So that show was on from like 1950 something into the 80s. They had over like 1500 shows and that they only bought one year and they keep showing them on a loop. So and, and it's the exact same thing yeah, you guys probably hear my notification sounds. I probably should turn on uh, Do Not Disturb. Uh, I can do that. <laughs> that's that's a good thing about Noom. Sorry about that. Keep, people keep pinging me on on Discord. Uh, but anyways, the you know they just play the same things over and over again, and it's just it, it's not a great experience, and yet you still have to pay more and more money for it. And that's the reason why it's much it's so attractive to me to go through and try to host as much stuff, to own as much stuff as possible. Uh, because then I'm, I can just watch whatever I want, and, and if I never, if my my viewing habits never change, and I never get exposed to new stuff, that's my th thing. And and if I want to, if if like there's an in internet phenomenon like Game of Thrones or Downton Abbey back when you know a few years ago, or you know whatever, I can I can go subscribe to the thing where that's at for whatever duration that it's on. And then when it's done, I can cancel it. And that's the way that I'm going to end up being able to save the money that I want to be able to save. Uh, I won't be able to own those things until they come out on DVD. And then I can own them and put them in my library and then never have to worry about it again. So, you know, it's just... I, I think that we're entering an, an age. I, and I hear from more and more people talk about how, you know, they just... It's too expensive to deal with all this stuff. And it absolutely is. So I think that self-hosting and owning your physical media, or at least a digital copy of your media, is, is going to be more and more important as uh, time goes on. And it's interesting that there's, you know, to kind of bring this into the open source realm, because you know, this is a Linux podcast, believe it or not. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, you know, things like Jellyfin. I, I, I know I mentioned Plex. I prefer Plex because the UI is better. Uh, but I know a lot of people adore Jellyfin, and it was good. I used it for a little while. Uh, I just prefer the UI of Plex and some of the features. But things like open source, things like Plex or uh, Jellyfin are there. There, uh, I've been messing around with Audio Bookshelf. There's one called, what's it called? Uh, it, uh, Kavita, K-A-V-I-T-A-A. -A. Uh, Steve pointed me towards that. That's basically for books. Uh, so you can do regular ebooks, and there's a whole bu there's a couple of them that can do manga and anime and stuff that actually have apps for your phone and your tablet or whatever. So if you are technically able to mess around with self hosting, I think that there's a lot of opportunities out there for you to do so. But like you said, there's not an awful lot of good places for you to go get the content. You know, like if you want if you want ebooks, like and you want to be able to put them in your software and actually own them so that nobody can yoink them off from your account because they no longer have the rights or because they want to sell the rights to someone else. Being able to do that is really hard, legally. <laughs> There's lots of ways of doing it that would get me demonetized, but if you want to do that legally, it's not easy to do. Now, I, I, a lot of the eBooks you actually buy from places like kindle and and apple don't actually have drm on them some of them do 
Some of them don't. You, like A lot of times at the beginning of the book, they'll actually say, uh, this author and publisher have chosen not to put DRM on this content. And if you are lucky enough to find those books, you can then figure out how to get that content off from your devices and put it wherever you want. Not all of them are like that, unfortunately, which is disappointing. Music is, was actually a good thing, right? Because at the beginning, you know, there was iTunes. And iTunes had DRM. And it sucked donkey balls, right? It was like really, really bad. Nobody liked it. You couldn't put your music on any other MP3 player. You couldn't rip it to a DVD or a CD. None of that stuff. It was all DRM-ified. You couldn't move around. And, th and they had that situation too, where you bought something and they lost the light rights to it, or they sold the rights to it, and it was yanked out of your library. Eventually though, they, they did manage to, or were convinced to, remove the DRM from their music, and that has kind of become the default for music buying. Now, it's obviously most people have moved to streaming, so then you're back into DRM stuff, but with, you know, like if you can find a place to actually buy the music, you should be able to have it DRM free. Movies, still mostly DRM'd, right? Vast majority DRM, but you can, if you can find a physical copy like a DVD or a Blu-ray or whatever, you could rip it. That's, but like you said, you're you're finding that you can't really buy the the DVDs anymore or whatever. I I haven't actually buy a, a DVD like ever. <laughs> uh, I like in, well, in since years. I I picked up a DVD in one of the dollar stores. It was a new DVD though. They put them right at the registers. I was looking at it, and at the bottom, it give this little thing said code included to yeah i'm like what why and i still don't i still don't get this i got a question an actual linux kind of question but uh i still don't understand this uh when you buy a cd through like youtube music or whatever and you have to use youtube to listen to it that's like going into a walmart buying a CD that you want to listen to and you get to the door and the greeter says, you need to leave that. You can only listen to it when you come back. I just think that's a line of bull. It's just pure bullshit. But in the old days, I used to work on people's computers and get malware and stuff off of their computers. And I would back up their, uh, user folder and everything. And they would have like, uh, their, uh, Apple store music and there were M4A, format and stuff and i would go ahead and snag them and add them to my collection and i could play them in linux i didn't have any problems when i tried to do it in like windows i couldn't play them because i had the drm but i could play them in linux with through rhythm box no problem but what i was going to ask you is are you using mechanical drives for your home server or are you using uh ssds or what do you and how, and how how big so I have, in the machine, I have a 512 gigabyte NVMe, NVMe uh, that has Proxmox on it. And then I have a, ter then I have a JBOD enclosure that has eight bays and has three of them, has three of them populated. Right now I have a 14 terabyte, I have an 18 terabyte and two 12 terabytes in there right now. I'm gonna going to get more, and my original plan was to do some software raid, but software raid does not work very well. Uh, created in a VM on Proxmox, I've learned that the hard way. It just kind of shuts the entire VM down. So I just have them as three separate drives, and it's worked out pretty well. I just have one for my backups, one for uh, the bigger one for all of my media, and then I have another one for all of the, the the YouTube videos and stuff like that. And then I have there's a play, there's a site called Server Part Deals where you can get certified manufacturer refurbished drives for fairly cheap. And when I say fairly cheap, I don't mean like you're gonna go get them for like a couple bucks. What I mean is like for for like two hundred bucks, you can get like a two hundred a twenty gig terabyte drive, which is fairly cheap in when it comes to you know a twenty terabyte drive because usually they're about you know three fifty or something like that brand new. Well, the one I want there's a sixteen terabyte uh, Seagate Fire Fire CUDA external drive and you can get it for three hundred dollars down. It used to be uh, nine hundred. Yeah, the, the SSDs ones are really. If you want big storage, you're gonna pay mm -hmm. out the nose for them. And I it has to be mechanical, most of them. So I, the, actually, what I, I probably have talked about earlier in this in our week in Foss, I bought a 
a, 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 a PCIe expansion card that has four NVMe slots on it, and I got it from eBay. First off, learn my lesson. Don't buy random PCI shit from eBay. Even if the guy has a really good rating, you're still getting stuff, random stuff from China. And some of the reviews that someone found, found about this particular card aren't all that great, so I should have done my research a little bit better, but that's beside the point. I haven't been able to use it because my uh, computer that I use that I was going to put it in, which is my main computer, has only one lane of that will support that particular uh, amount of uh, NVMe drives. And that lane, or that uh, PCIe slot, has my graphics card in it, so I can't move it away. So I'm going to try to put it in my home lab. I don't know if I can do that yet. I don't know if it has a slot. I haven't actually uh, opened it up and looked, to be honest with you, yet. I, I just have the, the card sitting back here. Uh, but I have four one terabyte uh, NVMe drives on that disc because I actually found some fairly cheap ones that were like 50 bucks a piece and I have those just sitting there ready to go and if I can get those in there I can then add an LVM in Proxmox that will give me a little bit extra space for some VMs and uh, extra storage and maybe actually a, a cache or something uh, to, to speed things up a little bit so that, that's my hope eventually to get that into, into the home lab we'll see I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to trust that card now that I've heard some people say that, you know, it's going to set my house on fire. Is it the Asus HyperX? No, no, no. And they're not any... <laughs> this is random thing from China. <laughs> well, the Asus HyperX is a piece of junk, too. Well, I've heard I mean, that, too. Because you have, you have to be able to do bifurcation, and if you want to be able to use it to its full capabilities, you have to uh, put it in your graphics card slot. Uh, you have to... If you only have two, you have to alternate them, one and one and one and three, or two and four, that kind of thing. And they have to be identical M.2s. We're talking brand, size, everything. Yeah, so this doesn't have a brand on it, like at all. All it says is made in oh, China. Oh, okay. And it, I mean, it has like the NVMe logo on it and the PCA Express logo on it, but anybody can put that stuff on there. Uh, you won't be able to see this, but everybody else will be able to see this. So what it looks like, it has four drives on it. It's just a little thing, uh, fits in a by 16 slot, but didn't work in my main computer, so I'm gonna have to try it in the in the lab. Yeah. So. Yeah. As long as you can do bifurcation, you might be able to get it to work. Well, I, my. BIOS for this PC had the bifurcation, and I was I changed it to whatever it was supposed to be. Still, would only see one of the drives. It actually saw all four of them, but only one of them was actually like accessible. Accessible. The other ones just basically said media. I mean, that's what happened with mine. I mean, but now when the thing is, is I haven't tried that card in Linux yet. This was in Windows, and it had the worst documentation for it and everything. And I even called Asus, and I mean, I didn't call them. I uh, they wanted a uh, rating on it, and I give them a complete zero. And they were like, "Oh, well, we're sorry." I got an Asus computer, top of the line motherboard that should have plugged into it and worked. Period. And I'm like, "Yeah." With that thing that Gamers Nexus talked about yesterday, I don't think I'd ever buy anything from Asus again. No, I was watching that today. I was I watched it. I'm, I think I'm halfway through with it. Yeah, they apparently have a lot of warranty problems. Um, so yeah, I have I have mechanical hard drives, and that's just the way that it go if you want stuff that's big stuff, right? Um, because it's just it's just cheaper. So the the so Josh told me like Josh told me, and then I found online later. But Josh told me, do not go with USB storage, do not go with the JBOD enclosure, none of that stuff. He told me to do that, not to or not to do that. And I, I probably should have listened, but it, I, I had no interest in buying or building a computer, like none whatsoever. He sent me a case that has the ability to, to be a, 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 like a NAS and has a lot of hard drive space in itself, right? It was very nice of him. But I have no interest in actually, when he sent that to me, I had more interest, but now I have even less interest than I did when he sent it to me. I have no interest in building one. So finding a built pre-built computer that has space for five six seven eight drives is basically impossible it's just you can't do it the only way you can get that kind of storage thing is either have a server like a, like an actual rackable server or you know have a nas which is you know they're like a 
consumer based NAS, which has usually has a lot of base, which is which was an option for me, I suppose. But I wanted an actual computer where I can you know tinker with it, uh, or do what I did, which was a uh, you know an external enclosure of some kind. Now there. Since I've, you know, kind of gotten into this, there were other ways I could have gone. So, like, they have the ability to basically, they have some that have, like, SATA ports on them that you can then plug into your H HBA card or whatever, if you have an HBA card, which is probably the way that I should have went instead of USB. But um, while, yes, the, stu the data that I've put on there is critical, like, I wouldn't want to lose all of my music and data. I wouldn't want to lose all of my YouTube videos, and I wouldn't want to lose you know, my photos or whatever, the very important stuff, the stuff that I'd be devastated if it was gone, like the photos and the tax document stuff, I have all that stuff backed up to high heaven. And I have multiple copies of my music and, and videos and stuff like that, as well on multiple different hard drives. I have all that stuff ba backed up. I'd probably lose some of the newer stuff, but that's fine. Uh, the only thing that would be like, completely gone would be the YouTube videos and the podcasts. And even then, I have some of that stuff on other dr drives. So, as long I feel as long as I have all that stuff well backed up, you know, it's going to be fine. And as long as I maintain my backup schedule, you know, it, it, it'd be, you know, it'd be fine. But I, I don't know. It, it's, it, it was a choice. I'm not sure still if it's the right one. Maybe I'll come to regret it going the USB route. But as of right now, it's fine. So I don't know. I know that I'll need more storage, though, eventually. <laughs> well, see, that this is where I believe Thunderbolt should have been optimized. Th Thunderbolt, th that should have been your go-to NAS outside access drives for computers to be able to have fast data rate. But it's just like... Uh, Firewire, it just fell to the side and it's pretty much not used by anybody. Well, I mean, it is used, but mostly on laptops, right? Like, you, if you want to, most, the vast majority of laptops that you buy these days that are, you know, like over 500 bucks will have Thunderbolt pulled on. Desktops, though, it's, it's just never really took off with the desktop. Like, Apple, yeah, but regular PC desktops don't traditionally have Thunderbolt on them. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with licensing issues because a lot of the motherboard manufacturers don't want to license Thunderbolt from Intel. It's still an Intel thing. But a lot of them do have USB 4, which is supposed to be equivalent now. Like USB 4 is supposed to be one-to-one -one equivalent with Thunderbolt, and a lot of them do. None of mine do, though, because I never buy anything old or anything new i should say like none of my stuff is new like i did build this computer in front of me brand new so i suppose i shouldn't say that but it too doesn't have this motherboard is really effing weird because it has a usb it has the ability to use USB C, but it doesn't have a USB C port uh, the case has a USB C port so i if i want to use USB C, I i have to use the front connector <laughs> it doesn't have one in the back so it was not great. I have I have that, but the uh, cable that I have to bring it to the front, it is too rigid and it pulls itself out of the socket. But I do have a rear USB C, and I tried to use it. And it doesn't seem to work. Yeah, you get, there's I don't a know why, but... there's a dedicated USB three connector that a lot of them have that you have to plug into the motherboard in order for, for it to work. Um, if it's part of the case, if it's part of the motherboard, then it should work. Uh, it's although, part of the, the one is part of the motherboard, yeah. Then it might be a, a CPU uh, a com compatibility thing. I don't know. Just kind of to bring it back on topic is that there are reasons why. I mean, there's a reason why people focus on streaming so much uh, outside of it being like the thing is because it's con very convenient. Like self-hosting your own stuff is hard. Like and, and it can be um, in terms of upfront cost. It, you know, it can be very expensive. So like you you know, buy three big large hard drives cost me like 300 bucks for 400 bucks to to, to 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 get to that point and that's not a lot of that upfront cost is something that a lot of people can't handle and the same thing with like you have to have a computer to have those things like even if you just have it like a regular computer that's going to store your stuff you have to be able to you know have that on hand you have to have the knowledge to do to do that and you know it, it's a very it's a learning experience it can be very expensive up front i mean I'm hoping that as I go along and do this, that eventually it will save me money and it will pay for itself, but it's obviously not there yet. So I understand that hosting your own stuff and your owning your stuff is, is hard for a lot of people because 
most people don't have a 65 inch TV in front of them and a, and a computer hip dad and they don't have my two monitor set up in a big computer and a home lab or whatever they just have a laptop and self-hosting on a laptop you know managing a, a large quantity of like tv shows and movies on your laptop is almost impossible because the vast majority of them only have like maybe a terabyte of storage in them so and even if you have one that has bigger you know storage you probably don't want to use it all with your you know your, your movies and tv shows and, and then carry them along with you and risk your computer getting stolen or whatever you know so there's a, a whole bunch of reasons why you wouldn't want to manage and own your own stuff just you know financially or because of space or whatever uh so that's the reason why i think streaming has been you know something that a lot of people have been very attracted to because you don't have to deal with any of that stuff it's just you know you, you give them 10 bucks a month you give spotify 10 bucks a month and you get all the music that you could ever want like all the music you know well and plus on external drives you have to deal with the heat issue heat issue heat issue um i have an external enclosure for an m.2 drive and one works great the other one is the same external uh case that i use but it heats up and then the transfer goes down to like 10 kilobytes so yeah i mean you got and that's on the m.2 i mean on your mechanical drives if you have a nas and you have six drives in a nas box you got to deal with the heat now. A lot of them come with fans, but those fans die probably within a year. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that the thing that I bought will last a little bit longer than that, but we'll see. I so like, I mean that and a whole bunch of other stuff. And there's just so many different, you know, things that go into this that aren't for everyone. And you know, probably my audience is the type of of audience that probably has a spare computer just lying around that they could use to do this they probably have a few extra hard drives running around lying around that they could do this but the vast majority of normal people just do not have you know that type of resources on hand and, and i think that that's going to be the thing that you know stops you know the thing that stops this from being uh, like a widespread movement unfortunately what are you trying to show us there hip dad i showed the three spare computers i have are you the one that had the the color iMac that sh you showed us the color iMac at one point? Was that you? I got five of them. <laughs> yeah, that that was you. Um, so you're you're a collector. <laughs> well, I mean, I've always been a person that uh, people have computers they want to get rid of. I, you know, they say it doesn't work anymore, or whatever, and I yank the hard drives out of them and stuff. And I still got hard drive. I got hard drives laying all over the place, and. Uh, I work at a college and they were upgrading their computers at the college and the guy in IT, he had a stack of them on the floor, like about 16 of them high. And he said, grab all you want. And so I'd grab three of them and I figure, I mean, they each of them have a one terabyte drive in them, mechanical drive. And I figure I might be able to do something with them. I haven't done anything yet because I'm lazy, but you know, like overall, just kind of to, to wrap it all up. Uh, I think that, People should try to choose something to host and own themselves. Movies and TV shows probably aren't going to be the thing that most people can do because of the space requirements, right? That you have to, you, you have to have a, especially if you plan on have a large library of stuff, you have to have place to put those things. So you have to have a, a large hard drive of some kind, whether that's an external hard drive or something more complicated. You know, a lot of people don't want to put that kind of investment in, right? But I think music is something that a lot of people can do because it doesn't take up as much space. You can put, you know, a fairly large library on a laptop and be happy with it, you know, or get yourself a small external like SSD or whatever, and you could do something like that where it kind of travels along with you. I, I think that that's an option for a lot of people if you are considering uh, slowing down on the subscriptions space specifically with music but even with movies and tv shows you can go to you know just try what the thing that i've been kind of preaching for the last few weeks since i've become a, a you know self-hosting fanboy apparently is to have people just try because nothing has to be extravagant like mine's overly extravagant but it doesn't it pales in comparison to like uh, craft computing or techno tim. Like you see some of their stuff, it's just absolutely insane. Like they've, they've obviously spent tens of thousands of dollars on stuff. You don't have to do that. 
you can just get it yourself an external hard drive and attach it to your laptop and you can you don't have to host anything it's just literally just storing stuff on your 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 laptop and you know you then you can have your music and you can save some money that way eventually as, as it pays for the hard drive or whatever and i i think that's as we go along it's going to be more and more important but it's it's going to be something it's going to be it's going to be for the select few i guess probably right yeah. I mean, I, I sassy, I'm going to answer your question real quick on one thing. Uh, you stated you had permission issues. Uh, thanks to Arch Penguin. Uh, he took me to a uh, Gnome disc uh, app and you can go into there and you can right click and take ownership of the drive when you format it or whatever. Or yeah, you just, that's the easiest way to get over that. And as far as TrueNAS and Proxmox, uh, what's the other one? Uh, Plex? Is that the other one? Plex is the media the media hosting one, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I've never messed with the TrueNAS and the Proxmox. I might do that if I fire up one of these. Uh, the the other one that you might look into is Unraid. Unraid is less VM specific and more just storage, and then it has like an app store that will run some Docker containers uh, through Portainer. I think uh, is what it uses is Portainer. I, I thought about. So I thought about TrueNAS, but it doesn't work well with USB storage or at all. Uh, Unraid will work with USB storage, but doesn't work well. That's the reason why I went with Proxmox. Because Proxmox, you, it just basically runs VMs, and those can very easily connect to the USB storage, and then it, wor it works fine. What I don't... You can run, if you wanted to, you could run Proxmox and then TrueNAS in a VM. You can do that if you want to. I don't know what the performance is like. You'd have to kind of test that out on your own because I've never tried it, but apparently you can do it. I don't know if you can run Unraid from a, a, a VM or not, to be honest with you. I didn't do that, I didn't do that, that much research. All right, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the Nuggies of the Week. Uh, I, I think that HipDad accidentally gave away his Nuggie of the Week earlier on. <laughs> Pretty much, but I mean, I looked at, I haven't really looked at it really in depth. I would say, I mean, I'll go ahead and do my nuggies of the week since I started yapping early. Flat packs, flat hub, another thing that Arch Penguin helped me with. When you go to the flat hub website, there's two links to click to install. You click it, you copy, paste into a terminal, execute that. Okay. You've installed it. Then you have to go to the next line and copy and paste that. And it basically activates it and make it makes it work in your system. So if you go to the flat hub site and you're like, well, this doesn't work. That's because you have to do the two things, not the one or the half, I guess. But, uh, so, and, uh, I also use warehouse, but, I'm using FlatHub, uh, a flat pack of uh, Steam because a recent update on Arch hosed uh, Steam, wouldn't run. So I had to remove it and everything. And you can have your games on a, 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 a different drive on your computer. And when you install Steam flat pack, you can guide it to there. But you have to use a program called FlatSeal and enable it to detect that drive for your steam uh, flat pack. So it is possible to do it and you don't have to re-download all your games. So I would say flat hub and flat seal are the, my nuggies of the week. Good picks. All right. So I have two as well. Uh, the good thing about getting into this Docker stuff is that I have a lot of choices. Uh, this time I chose audio bookshelf and uh, there's one, there's an app that will work with iOS called Plappa, P-L-A-P-P-A. -P -P it's a great name. Uh, don't, don't, don't knock it. It's a, it's a great name. Um, but anyways, the, basically audio bookshelf is for self-hosting audiobooks, as the name suggests, right? And you can get those audiobooks through any number of means. You just put them in a folder and it recognizes it. It's kind of like Plex, but for, specifically for audiobooks. Uh, I haven't messed around with it much because I just got it set up this morning. Uh, but with the Plappa app, you can then listen to them on your phone. That's iOS. I believe there's one for Android as well that's directly from Audio Bookshelf. Uh, so if you have Android, there's a place you can do that. And like I said, I have a, I'm have spoiled for choice, so I have, I'll have more 
for this in in the coming weeks so you guys can kind of see some of the stuff that I've been self-hosting. I might do a, a video uh, about self-hosting stuff, but a lot of people aren't very interested in, in home lab stuff as I've found, at least not, you know, in terms of on my channel. I don't know. Well, it sounds daunting is why most people don't want to do it. It's, it just sounds like this big daunting uh, networking. Just It's just overwhelming to most people. Yeah, it's overwhelming me. Overwhelming me to me too. I don't know anything about networking. <laughs> I, I, I found found. I used to think that I knew a little bit about networking, and then I watched some videos and realized I didn't know shit. Um, like nothing at all. Anyways, uh, that's it for this one, guys. Uh, we had a good time talking about this. If you have uh, thoughts or whatever, you can leave those in the chat right now. If you're still watching live or in the the comment section below, you can also find all sorts of ways to contact us. The best way is to head on over to the website that's available at the linuxcast.org. There you'll find previous episodes all the way back to season one, as well as select blog posts when I do remember to actually, you know, blog. But all that stuff is at the linuxcast.org. You can email us at email at the linuxcast.org as well if you want to do the whole old-fashioned email stuff. Definitely, I answer every email now that you guys send. It may take me a couple weeks. I'm not very fast at it, but uh, I do do it. Um, so you can email us there as well. Uh, Hibdad, do you have any uh, place that you want to share, like Mastodon or YouTube or Discord or something like that? I don't even know. Not at this time. I don't think I could handle, you know, the millions and millions of people that would join my Discord server. Yeah, okay. Um, you can find Hibdad roaming around my Discord server and Zany's Discord server as well. So if you want to give Hibdad a, a chat, you, you can find him in, in various places. I, I usually hang in the VC chat playing uh, Generation Zero. One of those newfangled games all the kids are playing. <laughs> uh, anyways, you can also find all of our contact information at thelinuxcast.org slash contact. There you'll find all of my stuff, all of Tyler's stuff who's not here. He did eventually end up in the chat, so... Good morning, Zany. Welcome. I, was, I assume you were probably sleeping or something because you were messing around with Windows is what I've been told. We, we thought there at the beginning that Windows may have murdered you. Um, just, you know, we, we were worried about your health. Uh, anyways, uh, that's it for this one. If you want to get in contact, you can find all of those places that I just talked about. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the challenge would not be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you so very much. If you want to support me on Patreon, it's patreon.com slash linuxcast. Thanks to all of these fine people who do support me over there. You can support me on Ko-fi and YouTube. Those names are also here on the list as well. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We record this live every Saturday at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, and it is every Saturday. We've never missed one ever. Um, just, <laughs> you know, ever missed one. Just If you thought we missed one, we just did it in secret. You didn't know about it. Those are the secret episodes. They'll be released after we all die. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.